So my name is Julien. Uh, I'm an architect at a company called Edge IQ, uh, where we build a product uh, management platform for uh, managing, operating fleet of connected devices. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a device management communication standard called the Lightweight M2M and um, the related open source project uh, for implementing it. Um, so, uh, the first part of my presentation is an introduction to Lightweight M2M. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lightweight M2M and Co-op. I don't know if you are familiar with Lightweight M2M. One, two. Okay, yes, quite some people who don't know it. So, so okay, so um, I'm going to talk about Lightweight M2M, then discuss a bit about the Eclipse Lation project, which is a more server-side implementation of that. Oh, you can use that with the Zephyr client. And uh, yes, and then the last part is more about um, when to use Lightweight M2M and a bit, of on, a bit of feedback on the standards that it start to be quite old now. Um, so first, yes, Lightweight M2M is built uh, on top of the constrained application protocol. And it's mainly why Lightweight M2M is called Lightweight, because Co-op was built in a way to be a light protocol replacing um, TCP and HTTP in a single protocol. Uh, basically, you have the same semantic as uh, HTTP. You call URLs uh, with paths, with methods. You get a response code. Uh, Theoretically, you have a transparent mapping with, um, with HTTP, which is not the case for Lightweight M2M due to the way Lightweight M2M is using Coop. But the way Coop was designed was really to, to build this HTTP uh, replacement, but for lightweight IoT devices. Plus some extra features which are not available on HTTP, like um, observation for streaming data, uh, back from a single request, you issue a, a get, and every time the value change, you get multiple answers to that. And a blockwise transfer, which is a way for constrained devices to negotiate the size of the message uh, exchange with uh, with the server. Um, Mainly, yeah, mainly it's something you apply to only for IoT devices. On HTTP, you have a chunk encoding, but it's different, I would say. And then, yeah, Co-op is very compact. Um, from a um, high-level point of view, it's basically a, a, a small header uh, defining what kind of message it is. It is a, a get, is it a re an answer to, to something, etc. A token for correlating multiple messages between them for creating a, a transaction. And um, the equivalent of uh, HTTP headers, uh, which, which are called options uh, for, um, for example, defining the content type of the payload, but in place of using a text based header like you do in HTTP 1.1, uh, here you use numbers a code for the header, the option you want to set, and a code for uh, for setting the value, like one code to say uh, content type, and one code to say it's uh, text, basically. Um, yes, and then you can push a payload with the co-op message. So if, for example, if it's a response to a get, you can have a payload, but if it's a get, you just have the description of the get, but you don't have a payload. So, lightweight M2M. Um, so the, I, the first, uh, the first uh, release 1.0 was published in 2017. It's, uh, it was started way before. I think I worked on the prototype of an implementation in 2014, so it was based on some draft. Um, it's a standard managed by the Open Mobile Alliance, which is a, 
uh, a standard body uh, focused on cellular technology. So it's not like the 3GPP, which is focused more on the wireless uh, protocol. Open Mobile Alliance is more focused on the application layer, I would say. Um, and it was started to be a replacement to, for home ADM. So home ADM was, uh, or still, probably still used, uh, a device management protocol for mainly cellular phones, uh, where you were using HTTP and XML, a binary version of XML, uh, to uh, manage the, the, the phone, or it was also used for machine-to-machine -machine communication. And when we started to see uh, new wireless technology like LTM and, and BIoT, we know that Home ADM will not be very efficient on that, so that's why the Home started the work on the, on the lightweight M2M protocol. So the, basically, in lightweight M2M, you have multiple uh, protocol in one. It's a bit like co-op, which is replacing uh, you, um, TCP and HTTP in a single protocol. In lightweight M2M, you have multiple uh, parts, which are basically the replacement for, I would say, three or four protocols. Um, the first part is the bootstrap phase, uh, which is mainly a way for uh, provisioning devices. So you provision your device at the factory with some key uh, material and some URL for reaching a, a, what we call a bootstrap server, and then when the device come online, uh, it's reaching the bootstrap server, and then the bootstrap server is in charge of giving the connected device um, the URL and the credential for connecting to the management server. Most of the time with lightweight M2M, you use one management server, but there is some use case where you can have maybe two. Uh, I never seen more than two, but, um, but yeah. The idea is to use this bootstrap server to redirect the device or configure the device to go in some places. So, for example, to manage in, on which server you are going to put your devices. Could be based on regions or application or whatever. And also, you can use it as a way for distributing the key, uh, the certificate or the pre-shared key for security authentication. And uh, yeah, and if the device at some point is not able to reach its device management server, the protocol mandate the client to go back and redo the bootstrap phase. So it could be also used as a, a fallback mechanism. Uh, then you have something which is looking more like a presence protocol, which is the registration phase. And um, it's where it's interesting to see how co-op is used because it's where you can see that co-op is not really used as you will do with um, HTTP uh, client and server. So the device start, want to register with the device, issue post on the, device, on the server, providing it some information, and then uh, the server answer with some token and the device now uh, needs to refresh this token to show that it's still online and uh, still um, remember its state. For example, if the device reboot losses tokens, this registration token, then it's forced to do a new registration and then the server knows that the device lost its state and it's useful for some management operation I will discuss about later. The, um, yes, once the device uh, issue a post for registration or for updating, then the server can also issue get post uh, put to interact with the device. So it's where it's a bit strange. It's not like when you use a HTTP uh, and an HTTP API. Is you have the two sides, the server and the and the device sending methods to each other. Um, so yeah, so it's used to be, it's used for showing the presence of the device, but also what is um, important to note is that since we are using UDP, and if you are using UDP with a private network, uh, behind a public network, in the middle you have a NAT gateway which is in charge of rewriting the, the IP address, 
And what is particular with UDP and is the default session time for those middle box, for those NAT router. Usually it's more like uh, 180 seconds uh, for UDP, where for TCP it could be uh, hours. Uh, most of the time, 20 minutes is safe, I would say. So if you don't refresh every 100 seconds or so in this kind of configuration, which is quite common, uh, your, um, your ability from the server to reach the device will be lost or you will need to wait for the device to refresh its uh, registration to be able to send a command. So, so yeah, so it's important. Sometimes you think, okay, I'm using UDP, I'm lightweight, I'm going to send less messages, for example, for uh, over a cellular communication. But in fact, if you need to be online 100% of the time, maybe with UDP you will send more packets than with TCP. Um, also, yeah, so there is the registration and there is a special mode for the registration called Q mode for device which don't want to stay online all the time, typically battery, battery constrained devices, for example, a smart meter, a smart meter, maybe you need to connect once a day to push, to say hello to the server and the server to retrieve the metering information, but Probably you don't want to send a message every 100 seconds to, 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 to keep online. So the Q mode is that you are going to say, the device is saying, I'm going to go offline after some time, which is most of the time uh, 80 seconds. If the server don't send instruction to the device uh, in this uh, given time frame after the registration or the registration update, the device is expected to go offline and then come back later with a registration update. Okay, so we have these two first pieces, the bootstrap, the, um, the registration, and now you, we have the object model. It's what is most important in Lightweight M2M is what you use for managing the device, for reading values, writing values. And um, Lightweight M2M is using this object model based on URL, but each piece of URL are numbers, and uh, numbers, so the first numbers represent what we call the object ID. And um, the object ID, so there is a bunch of objects defined by the standard, and it's what provides the interoperability on the, at the device management level. So you have a device object, for example, representing all the device uh, information like the manufacturer, the model, the serial number, uh, and each device are supposed to implement the object in the same way and present the data in the same way. So you need to fit in the object model to become interoperable. Um, yes, so the standard define a bunch of objects plus there is more object than that. Uh, and then you have this concept of multiple instances or single instances object. For example, the device object or the location object, it's a single instance device because it's, you have a single device so you don't need to have multiple instances of that. But for example, our object which are a bit more um, uh, software or abstract like the lightweight M2M server which is the information for the various server the device needs to connect to, or for example, the software object, which is uh, an object for installing software on the device. They can be multiple instances um, because you can manage multiple instances of different software or multiple instances of the server uh, information uh, for the device. There is also a bunch of new, uh, well, new, uh, of um, object defined uh, for sensor, which was merged into the lightweight M2M standard for uh, managing sensor and actuator. So it's interesting if you want to expose some very simple value like a humidity uh, value, a sensor value, which are maybe not core to your application, because probably for your application you have those very specific needs, and probably you will 
design your custom object. But for example, you are building a machine with a very complex um, uh, system, but on the side you have uh, temperature monitoring, and you say, okay, maybe it's good to add it to my system. And in case in the future, someone operating the system want to know the temperature of the system to detect some problems, they will be able to look at this, um, at this value. So the object model is mainly uh, something you want to publish, uh, or at least you need to define it. Um, there is a central repository managed by the OMA. Uh, you need to define your object using uh, some XML definition language, defining all the values you have in your, um, in your uh, object. And, um, and package that, and uh, maybe you can publish that, that publicly, and the OMA will give you a number, an official number, and it will be your object, and um, anybody will be able to understand and use uh, what your object is uh, exposing. Or you can do a private object and uh, not publish it if it doesn't make sense. So we have this object model where we can read, write uh, values on the, on the device. Uh, now, how to push values and create a telemetry pipeline from the device to our, to our server. It's where you have two mechanisms. One, the first one, the first historical one, which is observation. It's um, a server-driven uh, mechanism. So the server issue get on the various object or resources it's interesting to it's interested in to monitoring with the observation uh, option on the on the query and then the device will send a first um, answer and then if any value change in the observed resource or object the device will send back uh, updates uh, of of the content now, uh, since 1.1, I think, yes, yeah, there is a new, um, new system which is more device initiated, which is called the send operation, which is basically posting some content with pass and values uh, to the server um, at, the, at the device uh, initiative. So this is not controlled by some configuration. It's really device application dependent. Uh, if you want to control it, you need to provide, to build something, an object or something else to, to configure it. Okay, so now um, talking about the open source implementation. So first, Eclipselation. So Eclipselation is already a Java li library um, for implementing lightweight M2M server and clients. Clients, I would say it's more, it was developed more for testing the server pieces. Uh, you can build a device using this Java library, but it's a regular Java library. It's not something very, it's not embedded friendly at all. Um, it's a Java library with no, with little dependencies and no framework usage. So I don't know if you, if you like to use uh, Spring Boot, which I don't like, but if you want to use that, you can totally take Lation and wrap it into Spring Boot, the Spring Boot framework, uh, if you like. It's very, um, we try to keep it very Java friendly, uh, plain Java. There is a, a web demo UI for testing the protocol, which could be useful for people developing clients and devices for testing the capabilities of their device. But it's really not something you want to deploy on the cloud and because it's not scalable or not secure. Uh, it's based on Californium, the uh, Java library for implementing co-op and DTLS. Uh, but since recently, uh, uh, a layer of abstraction between the co-op implementation and the lightweight M2 implementation was introduced. So probably in the future, uh, Lation will provide uh, um, 
uh, lightweight M2M based on some other Java library like the, the open co-op one, uh, which is an um, interesting one because it's simpler and lighter than the Eclipse California one. Um, and yeah. There is a sandbox if you want to test the device. It's always deployed with the latest commit. And there is two versions of Leshan. One is V1, which is stable. Sometimes there is release for bug fixes or security problem, but there is no feature development. It's targeting lightweight M2M 1.0, uh, and it's stable, the API is stable. Uh, and there is a V2, which is under development, which is targeting 1.1. The API is not stable, but it's something you can use in production if you are not afraid of fixing some API when you upgrade your library. It's basically what I'm using in, in production for HIQ and it's working well. And the Lishan maintainer is doing a great job to document the roadmap, or everything which is um, currently under, under work or um, or um, in target for the next releases, um, and who is working on what, uh, so you can reach the people if you need clarification or help on some features. And yeah, um, yeah, I'm I'm going to skip this part, but basically, yeah, it's a Java library. You configure it. You s you say, okay, I want to bind on this interface, this port. You can provide the models you want to customize, for example, and you start it. And when it's started, then the server is ready to accept registration from the devices. It's very different when you use a client because on the client, it's a bit different. What you need to do is define of the, all, all the objects you want to do. For example, for the Zephyr Lightweight M2M client, you need to define all the objects you need um, and set the values. For example, for the device uh, object, you need to set the manufacturer, for example. And um, yes, and since a lot of lightweight M2M is controlled and configurable through object by the protocol, then the client often is configured by setting values in the object. And um, yeah, as an embedded developer, something which is important is that this object model of lightweight M2M means that each time you create a new object, you need to consume memory for exposing the structure behind the, behind the, the object. So the more features, the more objects you create, the more memory you will need. Um, yes, yes, well, it, it's the, the Zephyr lightweight M2M client is supporting uh, some of the standard sensor object. It's very simple to wire the sensor object of lightweight M2M and the sensor uh, uh, facilities in Zephyr and with some worker uh, push the value in the, in the lightweight M2M object and expose that on the, on the, on the communication layer. Um, okay, so uh, now, uh, yeah, uh, a bit of discussion about lightweight M2M. So lightweight M2M is lightweight because it's using co-op, so that's what makes it friendly for using uh, wireless communication. Um, but that doesn't mean it's simple. Uh, you have this object model, you have this key uh, bootstrapping management protocol, you have these uh, registration pieces. Um, and yes, and over time you add more and more uh, features on the on the protocol, so. And also, the standard body, they try to keep backward compatibilities. So every time there is a new release, you know what it is when you want to keep backward compatibility. And for example, when you read uh, optimization in the release note of Lightweight M2M, what does that mean? That means they are not reworking what was done before, they, were, they are introducing a new feature, a new flag for having the feature behaving differently. So more release often mean more complexity and, um, and supporting more and more, uh, more objects. Um, yes. 
And also something to know that if so the interoperability comes from the way objects are built and people are uh, supporting, uh, try to, to implement the same object. So then from one server to another server, two devices are supposed to be able to manage the same way. But that means, for example, for firmware update, there is 20 way to do a firmware update in IoT. So sometimes, yeah, you could find that a bit complicated uh, the way it was uh, created in the, in the standard. For example, for firmware update in lightweight M2M, you have multiple steps. It's not you send a firmware and you wait for a result. You need to send a, write a package in line using co-op or send a URL. Uh, pull the status from the server to know if the device is downloading correctly. If it's downloaded correctly, fine, you can go to the next, uh, next phase or you need to look at the error code and the error code, they are fixed in the standard. So you need to categorize your error in the error code of the standard. And then, yeah, it's, um, on the, and then the, you go to the next phase, you ask from the server point of view, you ask the device to execute the installation uh, and same, you pull for status back, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be a bit complicated and you need to fit in the, what was decided in the, in the standard. So that's a bit the drawback to try to be um, interoperable, I would say. And also there is sometimes strange complexity like when they created this software update mm, object it's looking like, but it's not like the firmware objects. They have different states, they have different values for error code, etc. So, yeah, since it's a standard organization and you have multiple contributors, sometimes you find things like that, like pieces where, which were written by two different people and they not very well harmonized. Um, what is also a bit, uh, yeah, uh, a side effect of that, of this, standard uh, committee approach is uh, the content type. Um, I don't know, you, you will expect that for representing all, uh, such a model like where you have uh, key and values and values being string or integer or float or boolean or binary array, you don't need to have a lot of different way to do that, but you have from a device point of view, it's not so important because I think most of them are optional, so you can implement only one, two, or three. Uh, but from a server point of view, you need to be able to implement, uh, you, you must implement all the different uh, media type, and some are just the same in just a different language, like JSON and Cbor. Cbor is really just a, binary version of JSON. So yeah, so there is quite a lot of complexity by this accumulation of features. On more positive notes, um, what is uh, interesting is that, uh, I think it's today is one of the few, there is really little option if you want to be interoperable in the IoT device management world. Um, there is quite a lot of people using Eclipse So here it's just the list of people who agree to put their logo on the Eclipse website, but there is more than that. And, um, and from the lightweight M2M point of view, um, the, the standard is quite popular in cellular IoT. For example, if you are using a modem and for connecting, I don't know, over LTM or NB-IoT, and your device is carrier certified, you probably already have a lightweight M2M client in the cellular modem because it's mandatory for having the certification. So maybe you have a way for hooking your application to this uh, system and um, reuse something that is already there. There is now a large ecosystem of, um, of vendors. I seen some in the, in the conference. And uh, yes, and um, they propose nice solution for scaling your deployment, uh, either from um, client point of view or server point of view. 
exact, exactly what we do at HIQ, like providing a, a nice uh, device management uh, connected device operation platform. And for our um, low level lightweight M2M implementation, we use um, Eclipse Lation. Um, and that's it for me. If you have questions. There's been a question in from the um, online virtual from uh, Romain uh, Pelletat. And sorry if I've said that name wrong. Anyhow, he says, thank you for the presentation. Is LaShawn uh, ready for production as an LWM2M broker, even with customization? Um, OK, so yeah, as, um, as a lightweight M2M server, I don't think we talk about broker for, for lightweight M2M, but Lation, yeah, it's, it's production ready. In sense, it's a Java library. Then you need to create your server. Mm -hmm. And if you want to scale to millions of devices, then you need to create a cluster and put a load balancer in front of that, etc. But yeah, I, I, I know that today it's used for deployment of more than one million devices. Uh, you need to know how to scale your Java server, but it's totally production ready, I would say. Okay, he's got another question. Um, with Bootstrap, X509 certificate is transferred from the server to the device on the wire. Do you advise that the security, uh, do you advise that security mode anyway? Um, um, yeah. And so, then EST enrollment over secure transport is preferred, question mark. Yeah, so when you are bootstrapping, you can exchange pressure key or use certificate. But when you use certificate, you are not supposed to send the, uh, well, I think in the protocol you can do it, sending the private key uh, over the air. But also, yeah, you, it's possible to use a bootstrap protocol for a certificate with EST to enroll the device um, with uh, your public key infrastructure without exposing the private key. Uh, I think it was clarified in the 1.2, um, what the two release of the of, of the of the standard. Cool. Does anyone else have any questions? There's a mic um, over there. If people want to stand and go and ask any questions. Not seeing any. Okay. Okay. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.